Okay, so this is Agisoft MetaShape. Um, I've laid out a couple of different screens here, and you can do that by going up here to View, and you can choose the workspace or the screen type that you want, or the screen layout. So if you wanted to bring up references, it would bring up this reference tab here, which can be used for GPS coordinates or um, putting in marks onto the images. And that helps with um, drone photography in particular, uh, or images that you would have target markers in um, for aligning photographs together. But we're not gonna be using that for this, so we're just gonna have our photos pane open, our workspace, and our model. So everything that we do in Metashape is found on the link workflow uh, tab up here at the very top. And you can see that a lot of this is grayed out in the beginning, but we can bring in photographs here and we're gonna choose add folder. So you can bring them in individually or you can bring them in as an entire folder. So I'm gonna just select the folder here. So we just need the folder, it's full of images and then say select. And then this is gonna ask me, do I want a dynamic scene or single camera? So for our purposes, we want single camera. And this will import each individual photograph into the scene. Now. I shot these using JPEGs. Um, it would have been more ideal to shoot using a raw image format so that I could control the darkness or the brightness of some of these images. As you can see some of them here are an awful lot darker. So what I can do is I can select all the images here and then use this set brightness. So if you double click on one image, you'll get this new tab coming up here. Select them all and then we'll select brightness. So just set brightness. We can estimate this and then apply that estimate. Now it applies over all of the cameras and will brighten up some of the images there. So those darker images will be a little bit brighter uh, and there'll be a little bit more detail in them. Okay, so you can see then we have 189 cameras here. So what I'm gonna do is add a new chunk. So come over to this little icon here and say new chunk. And then I'm gonna say workflow and add folder. So I'm gonna make sure that that chunk is highlighted. And then say add folder. And I'm gonna bring in the uh, recording where I turn the object over. And again, just select that folder and it will load in. So there's not as many photographs in this one. There's just 125 and I'm gonna say okay. And again, I'm just gonna scroll through them there. Yeah, so again, it's the same issue that a few are slightly darker than the others. So I just double click on one image, select them all, and then we can use a brightness and estimate that and just apply that over them all. Okay, so the next thing I'm gonna do is just rename this. So this is when I turned it over and then this one is when I left it up. So I'm just gonna give them names that will help me identify which is which camera set. Okay, so now you can see that the aligned photos tab up here, so we come back up to workflow and aligned photos is highlighted. So we're gonna press aligned photos here. And then we can use a bunch of settings uh, predetermined. So we can say we wanna go with high for this. We wanna use estimated, you can use sequential, but I always go with estimated and then guide image matching. So the key point limit by default is 40,000 and the tie point limit is 4,000. So we can leave those the same. Then we're gonna press um, okay on that. And then this is gonna start processing our images for us. So now both of my chunks here are um, processed. So I've gone back and I've done what's called a batch process. And I'll show you that step just in one second. This is the result of aligning the photographs. We can turn on this little show camera image here, and this will show us where our photos were. Um, so if you uh, think back to the video where you sh it showed me walking around the objects, you can see me walking around here and then moving closer to the object and moving back and forth. And then this is when I turn the object upside down. And again, we're walking around the object and here's where I had a couple of cameras, just where they were stationary, I must have taken one or two shots at the same time. So we can look here as well, 
125 photographs are aligned and 189. So that's exactly the amount of photos that we put into this. That's pretty good. Okay, I'm gonna turn off the cameras here again. Now, if we press this little button up here, it resets the view to the way the cameras are aligned with inside the software. What I like to do at this stage is to just realign this a little bit. Um, so what we're gonna do first is move the object. We're gonna rotate the object first. And you can see then we've got this little X, Y, Z. These little colors, red will move it this direction on the X axis. Z moves the vertical axis. and then Y moves that uh, lateral axis. What we can do is press five on the keyboard and then you'll change this to uh, orthographic mode, which means we can look down directly at the object and we can line things up a little bit better. You don't have to be 100% perfect with this. It's just getting a roughly aligned view onto the object here, and then we can slowly rotate that round. Okay, so the next stage is this little box around our object here. We're gonna move that box. So this little icon here is our region, and we're going to first of all resize the region. You'll see these little uh, dots at the end. We can grab those and move them in towards the object. All of this stuff on the outside then is completely ignored. We don't have to worry about that. We can come back then and rotate the region and this will help us to align it to the object a little bit better. Again, it doesn't have to be 100% perfect here. We're just trying to be able to see down through it. And then if we rotate this, I'm just using the little uh, arrow pointer here to do this. You can see that our XYZ is actually moving when we do it that way. And then we're going to resize the region, bringing this down and bring this one up. And this is all data that we don't want. Now again, we're going to have to resize the box just as we get a bit closer in here. It's going to come to kind of a side view onto the box. There we go. And then I'm going to resize that region right down as close to the object as I can get. And then the same with the bottom. I'm going to bring that up as close as possible. So we can hit this little button here again to reset our view. And then we can rotate the region to align it with the object here. And then resize the region again. So it's not 100% necessary to do this. It is just a step that I'll generally use to get rid of an awful lot of data outside of the object and maintain as much data in here in the center. This helps with processing time, uh, so the speed that we get back our 3D models, this will all help with that. So I'm just gonna come around and make sure that the box is including all of our object. So you can just give it a little bit of extra room here. So if this box was to clip the object like this, then this part up here would not come out in our 3D model and we'd have a hole inside our 3D model. Um, so this is just to make sure everything is included. You can see there's a little bit of room there. It's plenty of room on this side and there's a little bit of room there. So that should be all of our fossilized stone just included in that little box. I'm going to show you the exact same on the, the downside. So uh, I used batch process to do both processes together and I'll show you that step now. Um, so again we're just going to rotate this object. And again what we're looking for is to be looking down directly onto the object trying to make sure these lines are as straight as possible. And then we're going to resize, sorry, firstly rotate the region just so we get a little box. And then we're going to resize the region. Coming down to as close as the stone as we can. 
coming over here then to our navigational tool and just changing our view so that we can see it lengthwise. And again, bringing this down to come as close to the object as possible. And the same then from the bottom, bringing that all the way up. And we want to go right above the Lazy Susan that it's on, the, the little turntable I put it on. So we're cutting the bottom of it off essentially. Um, and then bring in these sides. And then clicking back on our reset view, and then we can rotate this. So rotate region. And we can resize that again. And like I say, it, it doesn't have to be perfectly aligned. It's just so that the object fits within the box and the box isn't clipping us in any way like that. Okay, we're gonna come back here then to our um, reset view. So I'll just show you one more thing. So if you, if you find that a little bit difficult or you find that uh, hard, some of this resizing is done in the next step anyway. So one thing that you can do is you can come up to your model view up here and you can say gradual, gradual selection. This only works on the initial tie points, the aligned points here. And you can just go through each of these. So if we went to criteria, reproduction error, and then you move this along, you're taking away as many points as you can without going to the end, because then we delete the model. So for this case, we're probably going about 0.2 press OK and then we're going to press delete up here or you can press delete on the keyboard and it just gets rid of a couple of extra points. So we're going to go to model, gradual selection and then we're going to choose the reconstruction uncertainty. So this is how certain the computer is that reconstruction can be done from these points. You can see you can go quite far with this one. So it's taking away all of that additional stuff from the outside and a couple of extra what we call floating points. If you go right up to the end, it will take everything, but getting quite close. So I'm using 17 here on my settings. And again, we can just press delete, come back up to model and go then to gradual selection. We're gonna use image count. So this time it's how many images we're going to use to reconstruct points so or how many images um, include all of these points so in this case two of these images will include all those points now at this step if you were to go in and you were to get rid of an awful lot inside of that uh, you might say to yourself well that's not worth it so the image count can be a good or a bad choice I'll sometimes use this for this case I'm not going to because I think it's going to take away too many points around here. So I'm going to come back up then to model, and gradual selection, and then my projection accuracy. And again, this is how accurate the alignment of the cameras is. And again, we can go quite far on this. Press OK. And then again, you see that takes away an awful lot of those extra points. So if you're just finding that uh, resizing that box a little bit hard, you can also use the selection tool here and this will get rid of everything else. I'm just holding control to continue my selection and that gets rid of everything else that we don't want. So we've just left to put the area in here. So we could actually select around the box and then use this little crop button and then that will get rid of everything outside of that box. And you can even go inside and you can get some of those floating points in there and you can uh, delete those out as well. So I'm not going to do that for the up version, just to show you that this little bounding box here will get rid of all of this data in the next step for us. And I've just shown it on this version just to give an example of how we can use that model and gradual selection to get rid of the points around the object that we don't actually want. Okay, so we're going to go back over to workflow. We can go straight into build dense point cloud or for those of you that don't have powerful computers you can come down to build mesh so i'll show you this first and then i'll cancel out of it so we're going to use depth maps so you have a couple of options sparse cloud is what we have here 
depth maps are uh, the 3D depth that is drawn from our images. So you could go in and use depth maps and then choose a high, medium or low, um, depending on the speed of your computer. I would go high first of all, if that doesn't work, then put it down to medium. Um, and then we can use calculate vertex, co vertex colors underneath the advanced setting here. Okay, I'm not gonna use that because there is a better step to use. The only thing is it takes an awful lot longer and it takes a lot of processing power. So if you don't have that processing power, say you're using a laptop or a standard home computer, then you could go to build the depth maps and that's uh, kind of a little step that gets you over the line and gives you a nice 3D model. And again, if you're doing drone photography and you just want a nice ortho, that's the quickest step to get there. So I'm gonna cancel this. We want to build a dense point cloud, but I'm just going to show you the batch process. So if you have a version of Agisoft with batch process, I can remove this and then add. So we can say build dense point cloud. So we're clicking on job type. This automatically selects everything we have. If you only want to apply to some, you could just say unprocessed and then click on selection and select the ones you want to process. So for our settings here, we want to go with quality high. Again, if you don't have a computer that's powerful enough to do this, you could drop it down to medium. I'm gonna leave it at high. We want depth filtering to be aggressive. So again, I'm double clicking on uh, where it says mild here, and I'm gonna change that then to aggressive. Reusing depth maps, if you process the, the 3D mesh with depth maps, you can come back and do this later and do a little bit of extra cleanup, but we don't need to do it while doing dense point cloud straight away and then we do want to calculate point colors yes and we do want to calculate point confidence so we can press ok and we're going to save the project after each step uh, this will automatically save your file so again because some computers can struggle with this if the software was to crash it would save up to a certain point so we're just going to press ok once the dense points clouds are processed, we can move to this little tab up here and this will show us the 3D model as point clouds. So we can begin to see detail in the models now. You can see here all the additional detail around this has been removed and only a small bit of the detail within this area then that we don't want to keep has been left in. If we have a look at the other version, the same thing is happening where we have a small bit inside and then nothing outside. Now if we swap back to this, you can see that by reducing that little box, we've gotten rid of additional details out there. Okay, so the next stage is that we need to clean this up a little bit. You can see that there's a little bit of noise up here. We're gonna use this selection tool. So I'm gonna change this to a free form, and this means that we'll have a, like a little lasso tool. So I'm just clicking with the mouse here, using the left mouse button, and then drawing a line along where I want to remove points. And then as this is a lasso, I'm gonna swing that around backwards. And we can use the X up here to delete that selection. You can also use delete on the keyboard as well. If you make a mistake, you can press Ctrl and Z and it will undo. So if we were to go Ctrl Z, there we go. And then we can step forward as well. So you want to remove any of these kind of little floating areas that are slightly away from the model. And most of this will disappear when we build our 3D model, but we want to just tidy up as much as we can, getting rid of any additional details that we don't want. So this, um, this is where the table that I placed the object was. So what we're going to do is a couple of ways to tidy this up. We can go to tools, dense clouds and then select clouds by color and then if we pick a screen color we can select roughly what that color on the screen is going to be 
and then you can move this tolerance up and down there too high and it will select up on top of the object here uh, but too and too low it won't select enough so we'll make it about 80 and then we'll see what happens that's actually pretty good we're just going to zoom back out yeah, you can see there we've got little areas so what we can do is we can hold shift while using the selection and that will remove the area for us so if i was to just select First hold control and select up there. To get rid of that, I would hold shift and it will deselect for me. And I want to include some of this additional detail here. And just remove that little section. So this is a process that you can kind of tidy this up as much as you want or as little as you want. Um, it doesn't really affect the overall end result but if you don't want these little white pieces or little pieces hanging on to your model then it's a good idea to start cleaning those away now So I'm going to go right up to the edge and just a little bit extra just so I can get rid of those additional points that I don't want and then right into this edge here and getting those little floating points. This often happens when there's like a depth of field error on the camera where it can't tell what's behind the stone so it starts adding in colour. You'll often get it when there's sky, uh, say you're doing something like a tower house or a large castle you're pointing up towards the sky then you get these little blue or white lines around the edge of your model where it just can't determine what's part of the model and what's behind it um, so it's just it is a common error that you get you'll also get places there like where we have a little hole there um, just where it was a little bit too dark but that's okay that type of stuff will fill in. Now this large hole at the bottom that won't fill in but we will do a little step that might help us with that a little bit later on. And then finally we're just going to do a lasso around the bottom here and then swing that out and then anything that's selected we're just going to press delete on the keyboard. So I'll just do that quickly on the other side as well. I'm going to hit this little button to center the object. So tools, dense point cloud, uh, select points by color, select and then pick screen color and we can get that color in there. And then again we'll go for 80 and see how we get on. Now as you can see we've got an awful lot more uh, on the stone at the top here because it's a similar color type but we can just come in, hold shift and get rid of anything that's selected up there. For the bottom piece we're going to go a little bit more detailed here so I'm going to come down I'm going to select everything below this line up here generally where there's shadows on your photographs so the shadow of the stone pointing down onto the table uh, that's what we're getting here with this kind of a blend of color and also that we're not getting any model underneath that point and you can see how noisy or kind of speckly that is uh, down along the bottom there so we're just going to keep selecting this little area down here and then I'm going to press delete on the keyboard to get rid of all of that and again we've got a little bit of a hole but we'll fill that in later on okay so the next step we're going to come oh, we can actually see the detail of the, the cloud here so this is the point confidence this tells you how confident it is uh, that there's a reconstruction happening on the stone here Again, it's an awful lot more confidence there. We have got little bits of areas on top there and around the bottom where it's not overly confident, so down here. Uh, but again, we'll fix that up in a little bit later. Okay, so the next step is to go to build mesh. And again, if you're not using the batch process, you do this for each model separately, and these would be the settings that you would use. So you would use the dense point cloud. 
Surface type will be uh, arbitrary 3D. If you were doing drone photography, you would use 2.5, so top down, uh, but we're doing arbitrary uh, 3D. Face count, I want to go for the highest face count possible. Again, if your computer can't handle this, go for a medium. Uh, and then we're gonna be calculating vertex colors. So all of those are okay. It's gonna cancel out and I'm gonna batch process this. So you can always go in and edit a batch process and then change the selection. So it'd be the same selection here again. And again, if you have multiple things here, you might not want to batch process everything at the same time. So I'll often go in and just edit what I've done previously. So we'll be using the dense point cloud, surface type arbitrary. Depth map quality is going to be high. Face count, we want to be high for this model. Custom face count is okay, we'll leave that at default. Uh, and then interpolation enabled, point classes all. Calculate, calculate vertex colors, yes. Reuse depth maps, we can select yes here. And then use strict volumetric masks, no. Okay, save projects after each step and we'll let this process. Okay, now that the dense point cloud is processed, we can view the 3D model. So if we click on this final tab, we're gonna view the shaded model first. This is our 3D reconstruction. You can see here we've got some little gaps, but overall this is a pretty good model. Now we can use the solid version here to see some of the detail. Same with the other side. So you can see where we're getting some of this kind of bubbling here. This is where there's not enough points and it's filling in some data. And down here as well, you kind of get these smooth edges. So there's no real data there and it's just filling in little points. But up here on top, we have an awful lot more data. And there again, you can just see that kind of bubbling effect. Now, if we haven't recorded the bottom of this, uh, and if you don't have the professional version, you can just cap this off using the tools here, come down to mesh, and then close holes and that will close this over and then you can have a model that has one kind of side that isn't complete. You can also just leave the hole open um, and use other software later on to close that over. And again here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to process this as if uh, these two models weren't of the same object and we're not intending to place those back together um, and then finally after that what I'll do is I'll show you how to place the two models back together and reprocess them so that we can fill in these little holes with parts from the other model that we have so again if you have the standard version you won't be able to do that final step but just for now we'll look at what you can do with the standard version so again we're going to come to workflow at this stage we don't really need to be batch processing this, uh, although we could, but we're just gonna choose build texture, change that to diffuse map, source data is the images. Mapping mode is adaptive orthophoto, so this will give you the best texture map, and texture maps are the way, how, are the way that these photographs are laid out on what we call a UV map. And then blending mode, I'll generally go for mosaic, which is the um, the de default mode on this, I don't really change this too much, but my texture size will depend on what I want to do with these. So I'm often using this for much higher resolution detailing. So I'll go for a texture size of something like 8192. So this is multiples of uh, 64. So 64, 128, 512, or 256, 512, 1024. So once you get to 1024, 
you're starting into your 1K and 4K resolution, and then this would be 8K resolution. So we can enable hole filling, which is okay, and enable ghost filtering as well. But again, they're just standards that are there, and we would just process that. So again, I'm just gonna batch process this, but they're the basic settings that I will use. And again, batch process is just handy when you have more than one model. You don't need to use it when you only have one. So again, I'm gonna edit this, build texture, and make sure all of these are the same. So adaptive ortho, texturing from my cameras, blending modes mosaic, texture size is 8192. You do, like if, you're, if this isn't your standard, you'll just have to go in and just type that in. Uh, so you just double click on it and type it in. Texture count, you can change this um, again depending on the output. So if you wanted two maps at 8192, you could change the texture count there and it will create two textures for your model. But for what we'll need, just one is fine. And again, hole filling, we'll just say yes and enable ghost filtering, yes. And we can process this. Again, just save the pro project after each step. Once the texture is processed, we can change the settings on the mesh to the model texture. This usually takes a couple of seconds then to activate. And then this is our actual photograph mapped onto our 3D model. You can see here where sometimes color from the table that we had us on will leak into the image here. But overall, this is a pretty good result. And again, we'll just have a look at the other side of this. And again, you get this kind of stretching there where we don't have that much detail. So it's pulling the image over that part of the mesh there so this size is a little bit dark for my likings um, for something like this uh, where I, I didn't kind of correct my lighting as I went around um, that's very kind of hard to fix but we might be able to apply another type of map to this where that map will bring out the details for us so that's all kind of coming off one camera there and it's creating these kind of blurred areas. But overall, this section here, which is what we'll probably end up using in our final model, uh, is quite nice. So another step then that we can go to is going to workflow. I'm gonna build a second texture on top of this called the occlusion map. It automatically uses the 3D model and then we'll keep the UV, so keep the current map on this. And you can see there's no advanced settings for this. We currently, um, you can't batch process this and I'm not 100% sure it's available in the standard version, but it is available as one of the texture options um, on the, I think 1.62 of, of Metashape is the version I'm using here at the moment. So we're just gonna run this. So it shouldn't take too long to process and then build this texture out to place on the object. The supplying texture field does take a little bit of time then. Okay. So now we can change our model to show the occlusion map. And again, this will take a couple of seconds just to show up. So this one is a little bit overly bright um, we might be able to edit that outside of Agistop later on. Um, but you'd usually get quite a nice dark area where there's kind of shadows bouncing off the objects. Uh, and it can be quite useful. I'll do the same process for the upturn model. So again, we're just going to go work for build texture occlusion map and then all the basic settings with the texture size being the exact same as our previous model. So 
So again, as we zoom in to this image here, it's a little bit over wise, but we can edit this afterwards in something like Photoshop, where we can darken that up a little bit and you'll get a lot more detail coming out of this. Okay, at this stage, what you, again, if you just have the standard version, what you'll be doing is exporting your model and then we'll export as an OBJ file. So I'm just gonna put this in an output folder. I'm gonna call this fossil high up. And the basic parameters are already selected here, so we don't really have to change them. You can include comments to say uh, the source of the projects that you're working on for this. And then I'll just repeat that process with the bottom model. And again, I'll just bring that back to the center. And I'll just call this Dan. And that's the basic process of photogrammetry. Um, Either one of these models is quite suitable. What we'll look at in the next video then is how to add reference. And again, I think it's something that is only uh, possible using a professional version of Agisoft. So this would be the standard workflow. And then uh, from here on out, we'll look at some of the professional workflow. This is what the ambient occlusion map looks like inside of Photoshop. You can use whatever software you're more comfortable with for uh, photo editing. Uh, or image editing so you can use stuff like GIMP which is a free online version of Photoshop um, but because I have access to Photoshop and I'm much more comfortable using this I prefer to use this so the ambient occlusion map you can actually see this is a lot better than even what we were looking at in the viewer in that we're getting these white and dark areas these kind of blurry areas in between are actually not our model at all so what you're looking here for the model is this kind of darker area if I was to drag in this section, so this is the colored texture. This is what the model actually looks like here. So sorry, I just brought in the wrong one there. So this is what I should bring in. So here, this is the ambient occlusion, or this is the, the diffuse color version of this ambient occlusion over here. So I'm gonna copy this and just paste it down over this so just you can see the details of it. We could go and just multiply the layer here and that multiply will bring out some of the details here. But what I'm gonna do is go back here to normal mode. I'm gonna come up to my image and we're gonna mess about with the curves first of all. So what we want to do is actually darken these up. Yeah, something like that looks okay. And then again, we can go to multiply and then this will create these kind of shadowing effects uh, where we've got darker areas. Uh, we can also do some more kind of blending here. So some of the different blend modes will give us different kind of effects over the object. So something like this will kind of really make the, it gives, let, allows the color to kind of pop through uh, when you're using hard lights or pin lights, uh, but still gives that lovely shadowing effect that we really, that we're kind of looking for within the model. So again, I kind of like this um, hard light version here. So you could use this as kind of a sepia toned version of the model you can put this over as your main texture and then have this normal map here just with the shadows as your ambient occlusion map and I'll show you where that we place those inside of Sketchfab which is the 3d uh, website that we use for hosting